This brings us to the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy is conserved. That is, any energy lost by a system has to be gained by its surroundings and vice versa. Now I want you to imagine that we had a system, like a chemical reaction for instance, that eventually transferred all of its energy to its surroundings. Now if we created a diagram to depict this, it would look probably something like this. The system has some level of energy. Gradually it transfers that energy to its surroundings. As it transfers the energy to the surroundings, the energy level of the system drops until it finally gets to a much lower final energy state. We'd call the two energy levels, the one at the start and the one at the end, E initial and E final. Now I want you to imagine that instead we had a system that absorbed energy from its surroundings rather than giving energy to its surroundings. If we created a diagram to depict that scenario, it would look something like this. Our initial state of our system, E initial, is at some energy level. As our surroundings transfer energy into that system, the energy level of the system increases until it gets to a final state, E final shown here. Thus we can say that the system's total change in energy, or delta E, can be defined as E final minus E initial. This turns out to be the case in either scenario, that in which the system gives off energy to its surroundings or the surroundings give energy to the system. Another way to imagine this is if we use a cool figure from our book. I want you to imagine that the energy of a system represents a bunch of money inside a safe. If I have a system that accepts energy from its surroundings, either in the form of work or heat, then the amount of money inside that safe increases. In contrast, if I have a system that gives off energy in the form of heat or work, the amount of energy or money in that system decreases. Now one thing I want you to remember is this. When a system absorbs energy from its surroundings, we call that endothermic, and it has a positive delta E. In the metaphor used here, we can imagine that as being a deposit into the system from the surroundings. Because we've deposited energy, either in the form of heat or work, delta E is positive. Now in contrast, when a system gives off energy to its surroundings, we call it exothermic, and delta E is negative. So in our metaphor over here, we have our system transfer energy, either through work or heat, out of the, its account. We end up having the change in energy, delta E, being negative. So once again, remember, if energy is absorbed by the system, delta E is positive. If it's given off by the system, delta E is negative. So I want you to remember, as I stated earlier, that energy is always transferred as either heat or work, which are once again abbreviated as Q and W respectively. Hence, a system's total change in energy, delta E, can also be described mathematically as delta E equals Q plus W, or heat plus work. This table from our book summarizes all of the different signs that we see for any particular change in heat or work for a given process. For example, if a change in heat, Q, for a given process is positive, that means that the system gained heat from its surroundings. If it's negative, it means the system lost heat to its surroundings. Just as our earlier example in which we discussed making deposits or making withdrawals from our system's bank account. Similarly, if work is done on the system, the overall sign of delta E is positive. If work is done by the system to its surroundings, the overall sign is negative. And in full, we can see that if delta E is positive, it means that there's a net gain of energy by the system from its surroundings. And if it's negative, it means there's a net loss of energy by the system to its surroundings. Interestingly enough, we can have some scenarios in which some systems have a positive sign for Q and a negative sign for W, and still have a positive or negative sign for delta E, depending on what the individual values are for both Q and W, or vice versa. So this begs the question, what in the world do endothermic and exothermic, which I talked about earlier, really mean? Well, when a process occurs in a system that absorbs heat, the process is called endothermic. 
and the overall sign for delta Q is positive. A process in which the system loses heat is called exothermic, and the overall sign for delta Q is negative. One easy way of deciding if a process is endothermic or exothermic is to determine whether or not it gives off heat. If so, it's exothermic, and if not, then it's endothermic. Let's take a look at some examples. I want you to classify each of the following changes as being exothermic or endothermic. How about fuel burning in a cap stove? Well, I want you to imagine, if you're sitting there next to fuel that's being burned in a camp stove, does that feel like it gives off heat or consumes heat? Yeah, obviously it gives off heat, hence it is exothermic, and its delta Q is negative. How about ice melting? Have you ever held ice in your hand? Does it feel like it's giving off heat from your hand, or does it feel like it's consuming heat from your hand? Well, yeah, it feels cold, which means that it's actually sucking heat from your hand, in order to convert solid water into liquid water. Because it does not give off heat, but consumes heat, it is an endothermic process and has a delta Q that is positive. How about fireworks exploding or water evaporating? I'll let you figure out these on your own. Here are two interesting examples I'd like to show you that you might not have enough personal experience with to be able to deduce on your own. The formation of sodium chloride and the thermite reaction, which is shown completely here. We'll finish this by showing you YouTube videos of each of those individual examples. After we're done, please stay tuned for our next installment of Chapter 5's discussion coverage of thermodynamics. A small piece of sodium metal is placed in a flask containing yellow chlorine gas. The flask also contains sand to prevent the heat which will be generated by the reaction from cracking the glass. Initially, no reaction is observed between the sodium and the chlorine. The reaction will be initiated by adding a drop of water to the sodium. Thermite. It's a powdered mixture of iron oxide and aluminium, which when ignited burns at two and a half thousand degrees Celsius, which is very, very hot. This is liquid nitrogen. It's specially stored at minus 198 degrees Celsius. That's 163 degrees colder than the North Pole in winter. But is it cold enough to neutralize the intense heat of thermite? into the slow release mechanism of a garden flower pot, the thermite is ready for action. Just light the touch paper and stand well back. The fuse triggers the irreversible thermite reaction. Scorching hot meets freezing cold, a fierce battle rages. The smoke clears, and incredibly, nothing remains. As the thermite burns at two and a half thousand degrees, it releases a raging torrent of molten iron, which rains down upon the liquid nitrogen, boiling the glacial mixture away in a plume of vapor and melting the cylinder, leaving just a puddle of white hot iron. A clear victory for thermite. So there you go, Dan. Adding something cold to thermite doesn't cancel it out. It just makes it angry. Thermite. You won't like it when it's angry. This is a car. It's been specially chosen to be destroyed because it's old, it's white, but more importantly, because it's French. The engine block is the densest part of a car. It's basically a huge lump of metal, and, well, it's very hard to melt. Lucky then, the Brainiacs have plenty of thermite, specially packed into the slow-release mechanism of a garden flower pot. A big pile on the bonnet directly over the engine block should do the trick. Time to light the fuse and give this homage to French engineering the send-off it so richly deserves. The irreversible thermite reaction begins. Within seconds, the fiery concoction eats through the bonnet, spraying molten thermite into the engine beneath. 
The devastation continues inside until finally a torrent of white-hot liquid metal pours out of the bottom, signaling the inevitable victory for thermite. A quick check confirms a clear path of destruction through the engine. Now that the engine is melted clean through, it seems only fitting to have a go at the petrol tank. Packed into the slow-release mechanism of a garden flower pot, the thermite is ready for action. Popped onto the roof, directly above the fuel tank, we top up, and just four feet of family car stands between the thermite and eight gallons of petrol. Light the touch paper and stand well back. Irreversible thermite reaction begins. Thermite produces a stream of molten iron which melts through the car in seconds. It's two and a half thousand degree heat igniting the expanding petrol in a devastating fireball, leaving behind a car that won't be going very far anytime soon.